Hello and welcome back. Today we are continuing our lecture series on uh, the 1920s. Uh, specifically today we're going to be talking about the communist threat or the uh, Red Scare. Uh, there's really several Red Scares in American history. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the first one's really going to be in the 1920s, uh, and it's going to be mostly due to the fact that, you know, even though communism, uh, as created by Karl Marx, uh, you know, a, a German kind of philosopher, uh, has been around for a while, it's not until the uh, you know the Russian uh, czars fall and Russia becomes the communist Soviet Union during World War One. Uh, it's it's not until that event uh, that uh, you know people really start to fear that communism might actually take over. Uh, you know, in uh, you know different places around the world, and even potentially maybe here in America. Uh, just as a you know, even though we've talked about this several times uh, in previous lectures, uh, just as a reminder, uh, communism is essentially the 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 opposite of capitalism. Uh, you know, uh, the, you know, capitalists don't believe that capitalism can survive in a world where there's communism and communists certainly don't believe that communism can survive in a world that has capitalism. Uh, you know, the major difference is in a capitalist system, uh, individuals have economic choice. Uh, they can buy, sell, trade, whatever it is they want, uh, and they make as much money as they uh, possibly can, you know, based on whether or not they can get people to buy their product, uh, which means there are winners and losers. Some people have more than others. Uh, communism, on the other hand, is government control over those things. It's government control over, uh, you know, socialism is just government control over wages and prices and, and, you know, what you can sell, uh, what you can produce. Uh, communism takes that and goes a step further and says, you know what, you can't even own your own property. The government owns it and they're just going to distribute everything equally. Uh, and the idea is there, in that case, there'll be no winners and losers. Um, now, uh, to just because we have to be honest here and we have to, you know, to tell the, the truth when we talk about these things, uh, you know, capitalism has big flaws, right? There are, uh, you know, there, there are rich people and poor people. Uh, communism purports to take care of that. Uh, but uh, there's never been an example in all of history where it's actually worked. Uh, you know, communist and, uh, you know, socialist countries uh, just fail uh, because they don't incentivize people uh, to uh, to work. Um, you know, some people claim that the, the like uh, Nordic countries are examples of of socialist successes. Uh, they're not, they're not socialists, they're capitalists, they're welfare capitalists, but they're, they're capitalists. Uh, so these two sides are clashing and, uh, you know, it, in America, it's going to be, uh, it, you know, uh, for the democratic capitalists, it's going to be really scary for them. Uh, it's not justifiably scary. There's really no threat that communists are over, going to overthrow America. Uh, but the average American is going to believe there is, uh, which is going to lead to some pretty serious overreactions. And uh, and we'll, we'll talk about that here in a minute. So is communism a threat? Well, uh, the common turn wants to make communism a threat in all capitalist countries. Uh, common turn just stands for communist international. Uh, and it is what it sounds like. It's a group that is designed to spread communism around the world. So, so for, in the average American's eyes, it's like, well, why, if you want to be communist, fine. Why are you trying to spread it? Right. And if you're trying to spread it, why are you trying to force it on me when it's something that I don't necessarily want? So it's the first kind of reason uh, that people are, are skeptical, skeptical of uh, communists is because like you're, you, you know, Russia and these other communist leaders are all part of the common turn. Eventually, Russia will take the Soviet Union, as we should call it now, uh, takes over the common turn. Uh, and it's uh its its stated goal is to spark revolution around the world, and it says it's going to do that. And this is what Americans are going to latch onto by infiltrating unions uh, and and striking workers, the working class, to overthrow democratically elected governments. And so, 
And the average American looks at that and says, we'll take you at your word. You're infiltrating the unions and you're going to use the unions to overthrow our uh, democratically elected government. And so not only do Americans fear communism, they're going to start to fear unions and striking workers as well. Uh, that's a huge mistake. The average union member, uh, you know, 99% of unions are filled with, uh, you know, capitalists and, uh, you know, people that support democracy and capitalism. And, and they're just you know, not communist, but the average American doesn't believe it because of the propaganda that the common turn is uh, putting around the world. Um, so it's this growing movement. It's been growing since 1917, and it's making good on its promises. It, it is going to attempt to overthrow the German government and the Hungarian government after World War I. So it, they're not just talking about revolutions. There's actual concrete examples of them trying to start revolutions. And so, uh, you know, which is going to terrify many Americans. And because all of this is happening kind of in, uh, you know, Eastern Europe, kind of the European nations that are most exposed to communism are the ones that are closest to the former country of Russia, the Soviet Union. And so uh, it's going to cause many Americans to uh, start to uh, fear uh, immigrants, right? And so we're, uh, you know, we, we have this weird belief in America that we were, because we have the Statue of Liberty, that somehow we've always been pro-immigrant and it's just like our current generation that is having an immigration debate. Uh, if you've been paying attention through all these lectures, immigration has always been a hot topic issue. Uh, and in the 1920s, here's an example of that. You know, we're going to look at foreign immigrants, particularly Eastern and Southern Europeans, uh, as a threat to the American way of life. Uh, because we think they're all communists. Um, are they? Of course not. Are some of them? Yeah, sure. I mean, just like everything else. I mean, there's a, also some just white dude in Ohio that's a communist as well, you know. Uh, uh, so it's, a, you know, to, to pin it all on immigrants is just uh, just a ridiculous idea. So uh, American fears are growing. Uh, and, you know, it, look, there's no doubt about it. Uh, Communism has been an evil in the world. If, uh, you know, and we've talked about this in previous lectures, uh, you know, they don't incentivize you to work hard. You can't, if everybody gets paid equally and everybody's equal, there's no reason to go to work, right? Uh, there's no reason, if I get the same amount of money for sitting down all day as the guy that's working real hard, uh, nobody's going to work hard. And so, you know, in communist systems, uh, you know, Russia uh, in the in 1919 and, and, you know, the time period in 1920s that we're talking about are literally enslaving farmers because, uh, you know, the farmers aren't growing enough food. Uh, they, they can't motivate them by paying them more. Uh, they're enslaving manufacturing workers. Uh, they're literally going to purposely cause a famine in the Ukraine that's going to kill about 20 million people. Uh, communism is is evil like and it, it's evil wrapped in this like equality argument uh and so there is a reason to fear communism there's no doubt about it but there's no real reason for in the 1920s for americans to fear that america is going to be communist so it's just much more complicated than the average person just like most issues it's much more complicated than the average person is is willing to accept and so uh, because America is afraid, uh, it's going to overreact <clears throat> and it's going to do some things that uh, let's just I'm going to call a spade a spade. You know, the American government is going to do some really shady stuff, uh, you know, because it's overreacting to this threat of communism. And one of those things is going to be the Palmer raids, um, which is a super unconstitutional and I would make an argument immoral uh, thing that happens. So. What happens with the Palmer raids? Well, uh, the Palmer raids, it's all about uh, the Attorney General Palmer. Uh, attorney General Palmer is uh, the, the lead attorney for the United States. Uh, he's in charge of uh, you know, the Bureau of Investigation, so it's later will be the FBI. And, uh, you know, so he's like the chief law enforcement offer for, officer for the United States. Well, a bomb gets delivered to his house. And so, uh, you know, it, when a bomb gets delivered, it blows up on his front porch, right? He doesn't get killed. Uh, it's delivered by an anarchist. Uh, an anarchist is not a communist. Uh, an anarchist believes in no government. Uh, and so a uh, communist believes that government should 
Google everything. So they're almost, they're the exact opposite. Uh, but because in our minds at the time, uh, you know, we kind of group anarchists, socialists, and communists all in one group. And, uh, which is, you know, you can do that with socialists and communists, kind of, uh, not entirely, but kind of. Uh, you really can't do that with all three. Uh, but, you know, the average American does because we just don't understand it. And <clears throat> Palmer uses this event to go after communists. And so, uh, you know, him and uh, J. Edgar Hoover, who will later be the head of the FBI when the Bureau of Investigations becomes the Federal Bureau of Investigations, uh, they're going to use this uh, event to uh, for their own political gain. They want to be seen as, you know, strong law and order uh, guys, and they're going to use uh, a law known as the Sedition Act uh, to uh, essentially start to round up anybody they believe may be a communist. And so they're they're going mostly after uh, you know immigrants, and they're going to round all of these uh, you know like union leaders, uh, you know people that really have you know maybe communists but are you know peaceful law abiding citizens. Uh, he's essentially going to round them all up, have them arrested, uh, and uh, put them on a red arc, is what they call it, red, because red's the color of communism, and ship them back to Europe. And he's going to do that without warrants. He's going to do that without trials, uh, all of which is is unconstitutional and illegal. But the American people will support it because they're afraid of communism and because of this violent act. And so uh, you know, these suspects are going to be rounded up. They're granted no, uh, none of their rights. There are no trials, no access to uh, attorneys uh, and are going to be shipped out of America. I mean, this is like, and sometimes this happens uh, and, and it's, it, to me, it's just tragic. You know, uh, we're, we're violating people's rights in a attempt to defend democracy from communism that like th th that's self-defeating right D in in a democracy individual rights and and your constitutional rights are what democracy are all about and so violating those rights to defend democracy is uh, absolutely ridiculous. It's intellectually dishonest. Uh, and, you know, it's hypocritical, right? You know, it's not, the democracy is not worth having if those rights aren't, uh, you know, always honored. And so, and, and, and this is not to say that, oh, America must be a bad country. No, I mean, it's just like anything else in this world. There's, you know, nobody and no country is perfect. And so uh, this is an example of us not behaving uh, uh, in a way that is consistent with our uh, ideology as a Americans. And so, uh, you know, it's, um, it is an example of us being hypocrites. Uh, and, and everybody at, you know, at some point in their life and every country and some point of its history, uh, fails to live up to the standards it sets for itself. There's no doubt about it. Uh, so, uh, I am neither condemning America nor am I justifying what it did. Uh, but these are very important things to understand because, you know, I think we're living in a time period right now where we're doing really similar things. You know, we're taking people who have descended ideas and we're silencing them. Uh, and I think that's just, uh, that's no matter which side you're on, uh, I think that's always un-American. And so, you know, it's personal conjecture, but uh, that's definitely what's happening here during the uh, the Palmer raids. And so we're going to use the, the cover of they're trying to overthrow the government, which there's no real possibility of that happening. Um, you know, some crazy guy might throw a bomb at a government employee. Uh, but, but that, 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 you know, that that's awful. And that guy should go to jail. Uh, but that's not evidence that there's uh, a real threat to the government itself. And so uh, the Pomerades are an example of this overreaction because of the fear of communism. And so will the trial of Sacco and Vanzetti. Uh, Sacco and Vanzetti are also, uh, they're immigrants that are going to get caught up in the Red Scare. Again, remember, we're afraid in America at the time of uh, people, particularly from Eastern and Southern Europe, because we're afraid that they're going to come in with these radical communist 
anarchist ideas from those countries, and they're going to try and overthrow our government. Well, Sacco and Vanzetti are Italian anarchists who come to the United States. Uh, when they come to the United States, uh, you know, they, they are political, and so they're on a government watch list. And <clears throat> What ends up happening is that a uh, local paymaster, a guy that's like in charge of the, the payments uh, for a company, is going to be shot and killed and $15,000 are going to go missing. Uh, and uh, when that happens, uh, somebody says they think they might have seen a car that is similar to the car that Sacco and Vanzetti uh, use flee the scene. Uh, and when that happens and the police have that information, they go and they arrest Sacco and Vanzetti. Uh, now, uh, Sacco and Vanzetti are already on their watch list, right? So the, the, the government already doesn't like these two guys because they are anarchists and uh, we're afraid uh, that they're uh, going to try and spark revolution here. So we're looking for a reason to go after them and this ends up being that reason. Well, Sacco and Vanzetti are arrested. They're given a trial. And in that trial, uh, they are arrested on what is essentially just circumstantial evidence. And so uh, they will be convicted on that circumstantial evidence. Uh, at, at the time, they, do, they don't have the ability to connect Sacco and Vanzetti to the murder weapon. There's a gun that was involved. They don't have the ability to connect, connect them to that. They don't have any witnesses uh, they, that, that can put the two actual guys there. It's just they're, they drive a similar car. Right, it's not even a perfect, uh, uh, you know, match uh, for the for the car. Uh, well, uh, while the trial is going on, somebody else will, uh, you know, during the trial, somebody else will confess to the crime, and so there, there's actually some evidence that these guys didn't uh, do the uh, do this crime. Uh, but because the uh, public is so afraid of these kind of radical immigrants politically radical immigrants, uh, they uh, are going to uh, be convicted. This is going to spark some international outrage, right? Uh, Europe and European countries are going to be really upset by this. They feel like, you know, that that these immigrants are like, you know, still their uh, family. Uh, and uh, they're going to be really disappointed. And they're going to point out that, you know, America is supposed to be the land of the free, the home of the brave, that, that we always are lecturing these other countries about rights uh, and, you know, uh, human rights. And then Sacco and Vanzetti, uh, you know, are uh, going to, you know, uh, be convicted uh, and, and essentially put to death for uh, on circumstantial evidence. And so, uh, you know, the rest of the world kind of calls us out on, on the hypocrisy here. And so, they are convicted uh, and uh, it's, and, and, you know, put to death. And, you know, the, you know, there's going to be a lot of people in America that are going to view this as a tragedy, uh, travesty, tragedy. Uh, and the world is going to really kind of criticize the United States that, hey, look, you're, you're violating people's rights uh, just because you don't like these political ideologies. Uh, now, to tell the whole story, the uh, Sacco and Benzetti's rights uh, were, um, I don't know if we can say that they were necessarily violated. They got a trial, they got an attorney, they got those things. Uh, but we should never be putting people to death based solely on flimsy evidence, right? These guys, that jury convicted them because they were immigrants and uh, because they didn't like the Sacco and Vanzetti's politics. Well, if you're in a democracy, you should never be um, harmed for your political beliefs, right? I mean, uh, it, I think today, yesterday, or 100 years ago, uh, that just should not happen. And that's what happened to these two guys. Now, to tell the whole story, um, you know, the, the, you know, this case ends up going all the way to the Supreme Court, uh, the Supreme, the, I'm sorry, the Supreme Court of Maryland or Massachusetts, sorry, not Maryland, Massachusetts, uh, and the Supreme Court of Massachusetts upholds the verdict, uh, and the governor denies them a pardon and, and they're going to be put to death, uh, later. And, and it's viewed as this kind of travesty that we let politics kill these guys. Uh, but then later in 1961, when we start to be able to, uh, 
uh, have uh, DNA evidence, uh, we can actually put Sacco's DNA on the murder weapon. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the 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 reality is uh you know the these guys uh, might have done it uh you know we we can't know for sure we can't go back and relitigate the idea uh but even if they might have done it there wasn't evidence at the time and as a democracy i think we really have to live up to this standard that everybody gets to have their political opinion and and you should never uh be at risk uh, for having a political opinion, even if it's a controversial opinion. I think that's a, you know, looking around the world today in 2020, I mean, I think that's a lesson that we really need to learn, uh, that, that people get to have, no matter which side they're on, uh, they get to have a, a, their own political opinion. So uh, the communist threat, uh, is it real? Well, the communism in America really is, is not a threat. Only about 1% of the population or 70,000 people in America are actually communists. Uh, that is not a threat in any uh, really kind of sus substantial ways. Uh, but people are afraid. And so what that means is that there's going to be this uh, fear, particularly for people on like the left end of the spectrum. I, I don't mean Democrats. I mean people that are further left uh, than Democrats. Uh, it's going to put pressure on them to not necessarily speak their mind. Uh, they're going to be in a situation where, uh, you know, if you are, uh, you know, a leftist college professor or something like that. Uh, if you speak your own political uh, ideology, you can be fired from your job. Uh, it's really going to demand conformity. Uh, and so it's kind of the opposite of what's happening now, right? Uh, you know, in the 1920s, if you're on the left end of the political spectrum, like so further than Democrats, um, then you're run off campus, you could lose your job, uh, bad things can happen to you, you're shunned in society. I think today the opposite is happening. It's, you know, if you're a Republican, uh, college campuses are uh, running you off the campus, you, you know, people are being fired uh, from jobs, from having, you know, uh, you know, further than Republican, uh, you know, right wing ideas. And so, you know, the pendulum swings. And so, you know, it happens. Uh, but it's always a sad day in America when, you know, you're, you're not allowed to, to profess your own political uh, ideology. And that's what's happening in the 1920s. Uh, organized labor is seen as a threat. Uh, they're seen as a threat, essentially, uh, because the Comintern has said that they're going to infiltrate these unions. Uh, there are these strikes that are happening all across America after World War I. Uh, you know, people are very skeptical of that. Uh, but keep in mind, those strikers are working. They're not trying to th overthrow the government. They just haven't had a raise since before the war. Uh, you know, prices are, uh, you know, uh, in certain places are going up and they need a raise. And that's why they're out there striking. Uh, but the American people think it's uh, more nefarious than that. Colleges are targeted. Uh, you know, if uh, you have a, a political view that is left of center, uh, you can be targeted uh, on the college campuses. If you're a, uh, you know, history, high school history teacher teaching about, uh, you know, communism uh, and the, you know, Karl Marx, uh, you can be fired just for talking about those issues. Uh, and so, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's, as a history teacher, I tell you, that's scary stuff, right? Uh, you know, there's, uh, uh, that, you know, there's issues today that, that you really kind of have to dance around because uh, bad things can can happen to you personally uh, for those things. So it's not as bad as it was in the 1920s, but it's, you know, one of those, uh, uh, those things that happens every once in a while. So now what's going on with the labor unrest? Well, uh, we've talked about this before, so I'm going to kind of fly through it. Uh, by the time we get to 1919, uh, we're seeing somewhere between three and four million uh, workers strike. Uh, they're not trying to overthrow the government. They're just looking for, for a raise um, because wages haven't kept up with prices. And so you know, a lot of these, you know, some of these business owners are just being greedy and they want to keep the profits for themselves. Most of the business owners uh, are just the, the economic situation in the 1920s, although it seems good, isn't actually 
actually good. And so for a lot of these guys, there's just isn't money to give the workers. And so we're in this really, uh, you know, bad spot. And we're in this bad spot because, you know, these workers are asking for what is fair. And, you know, the, the businesses aren't giving it to them, whether, you know, for nefarious reasons or for legitimate reasons, uh, doesn't matter. And so uh, because there's this, you know, tension between the two, the workers are going on, on strike. So uh, we are going to see strikes happening everywhere. People are concerned that uh, this, uh, you know, might be a communist plot. Uh, we're f afraid of May Day revolutions. Uh, May Day is uh, it, the International Day of the Workers. It's meant to celebrate the, the Haymarket riots. Uh, and, you know, it's uh, used as kind of the symbol for communist uh, revolution and communist takeovers. And so the government is afraid of these. Uh, and, uh, be, you know, be, while this fear is happening, uh, we're going to see strikes uh, happening all across the nation. There's three big ones that you should know. Uh, and they're they're th they're important for uh, different reasons. Uh, the first is the Boston police strike. Uh, what we'll see is uh, Boston police uh, are going to strike because wages haven't gone up. Uh, now you may ask yourself, well, why is that important? Well, remember what the American people think. They think that strikers have been infiltrated by communists. Uh, and so this is a really big deal. When the Boston police go on strike, uh, you know, Americans all across the country are like, what are you talking about? Have our police been infiltrated by communist revolutionaries? Uh, well, the answer is no. They just haven't had a raise uh, since before the war and, and, you know, they need more money. But this is going to strike fear in the hearts of Americans because they're going to uh, start to question whether or not uh, our government has been infiltrated by communists. And so uh, the uh, you know, eventually Calvin Coolidge, uh, who's in charge, uh, the, the governor at the time, is going to fire the entire Boston police force and rehire all new police officers just because he's afraid that they those uh, striking police officers might be uh, communists. And so one, it makes Calvin Coolidge, who will later become president, uh, gets him uh, you know, national notoriety. But uh, it also it's important because people are afraid that the uh the that the government has been infiltrated the next important strike is going to be the u.s steel strike uh u.s steel uh, used to be carnegie steel it's one of the foundational uh you know uh, companies in america it's uh you know helped make america what america is one of the largest companies uh, in america and uh 300 000, uh workers are going to walk off the job uh, this one is important, not because it's the government, it's a private company. It's important because of how big it is, right? 300,000 workers are going to uh, walk off uh, the job. Uh, they're going to be called communists. People are afraid of that. But really what they're looking for is just an eight hour workday and higher wages, like totally reasonable things. Uh, but that's not how America views it. America is terrified because it's like, oh my God, those are, they, they must all be 300,000 communists. Well, of course they're not. Um, so uh, they will eventually get the eight hour workday. Uh, the union also wants the right to, absolute right to unionize uh, within uh, U.S. Steel. Uh, the U.S. Steel will reject that. Uh, so they will get some of their demands met. And then the biggest strike, and I think the one that's probably the most scary for Americans, is the Seattle General Strike. Um, the Seattle General Strike is uh, it, it is a general strike, and what that means is it's not one particular industry. Uh, most Americans, even though they're afraid of communists, can understand and sympathize when one business goes on strike. It's like, well, maybe their boss treats them poorly or doesn't pay them enough. So if it's Mr. Garrison's hat making company and all his hat makers uh, go on strike and they say, Mr. Garrison makes us work 18 hours a day and pays us, you know, 25 cents a day. Uh, he's a jerk. We're going on strike. The average American can wrap their head around that and say, okay, maybe you're not a communist. 
But a general strike, that's a different story. Uh, this is going to be a citywide strike. It's not just going to be Mr. Garrison's hat makers that go on strike. It's going to be workers all across the city that are going on strike in completely unrelated businesses. And so, oh, you know, it starts out in Seattle in the, the as the dock workers go on strike, but then all of a sudden textile workers go on strike, people who make clothes and uh, fabric. Uh, and then uh, it's workers all across the city uh, end up going on strike. And the average American looks at that really suspiciously because it's like, well, you can't, you don't all work for the same boss. So you don't, what do you have in common, right? I mean, you know, it, it can't be wages. Some of you are paid well. Some of you aren't paid well. It can't be hours. Some of you work eight hours a day and others of you work 12 hours a day. It can't be working conditions. Some of you work in good working conditions. Some of you work in poor working conditions. So what's connecting all of you? It must be communism. Uh, now that's not true. Uh, they're, they're striking in solidarity. They understand that, you know, uh, that there's power in numbers and that, you know, you might be striking for better wages and you might be striking for better hours and I might be striking for better working conditions. And if we all strike together, we shut down the city, maybe our bosses will all give in to our individual demands. Uh, but that's not how Americans see it. Americans see it as it must be communists. And so as they go out striking, um, you know, the police get called in, the, the strikers riot. Uh, you know, I, I'll tell you right now, rioting is never a good idea. You you just don't ever get what you want when you riot. Uh, and that's what's going to happen. You Generally, there's a backlash against the rioters. Uh, you know, peaceful protesting is the way to go. Uh, but in Seattle, uh, the, the workers will, uh, you know, essentially riot on the streets and then the police will take it too far. They're going to start to arrest not just workers, but uh, union leaders. Uh, they're going to go in and shut down uh, some of the uh, pro-union newspapers. They're going to shut down a, a specifically socialist newspaper for, uh, you know, socialist propaganda. Stop and think about how important that is, right? We're Americans and we have a constitutional right to freedom of the press. The press can say, even if they say things you don't like, uh, even if they, you know, take opinions that you don't think are are accurate, uh, they still have the right to print that material. And so, uh, you know, but because we're so afraid of communism, uh, we are going to violate our own principles, and we're going to shut down the and uh, shut down and arrest the the leaders of these uh, newspapers. And so, um, the papers are are declared you know, Bolshevist uh, newspapers, they're going to be shut down and arrested. And uh, the, uh, you know, the strike uh, will eventually get put down and will be, uh, you know, uh, essentially, uh, you know, the, the press outside of Seattle are essentially going to claim that it's a communist plot, uh, which is, uh, which is a shame. You know, the, uh, you know, we, we again violate our principles in the name of defending democracy. Uh, and, you know, that's just, you know, in my opinion, never, uh, never a good thing. So this particular strike is terrifying to the average American uh, because it's, if it can happen in Seattle, it can happen anywhere. And it looks like communists are trying to overthrow an entire city. You know, there's people that are watching this and they're thinking, this is the revolution that the common turn is talking about. Uh, and so it's that what that's going to do is it's going to create a more of a red scare uh, in places all across the country. And again, you know, going to kind of have a chilling effect on free speech in, in, in America. All right. Uh, that is where we're going to leave off uh, today. We're going to talk about communism all the way through the 1950s. Uh, so it's a, an issue we're going to you know, continue to address. Uh, I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day.